Welcome back to the channel. This week we're going to continue to look at some of the places I visited while I was in Rome and today we are concentrating specifically on the Vatican Museums. Now, in honor of continuing this trip through Rome, I have the Rome shirt. This is the shirt that uh, saw me through no suitcase. Um, now, I had, you know, some other undershirts that I bought and a I did have a second shirt that I bought as well, but this is the one that I wore pretty much every day um, for seven days. And I thought it only seems fitting that the shirt should be in the video. Um, so anyway, uh, one of the things about taking a trip like this is that when you get back, you don't realize until you get back just how many dang pictures you take. <laughs> And I took a lot. So uh, I've, I've narrowed a few down and I want to talk about a few things related to the Vatican Museums. I'm not going to try to take you through all the pictures. So this is, this is how this is formatted. I'm going to go through some of the pictures here in the video. I'll probably add a couple of other, other pictures to the blog post. So if you're coming here from Instagram, you've landed on my blog page. If you came here from YouTube, then I will put a link to my blog post in the description of this video. And within that blog post, at the end of the blog post, um, will be a link to my Flickr album that has all of the pictures that I have edited from the Vatican Museums. I think there's 41 or something in there. I'm not going to bore you with 41 pictures in this video. So without any further ado, let's get started and talk about the Vatican Museums. This was, for me, the high point of my trip. Going through the Vatican Museums, the Sistine Chapel, and St. Peter's Basilica, that was, that was it. I, I, I set aside a full day for that, to just do that. Um, and I, I splurged. Um, I got a private tour, just me and a tour guide. Yes, that was very expensive. I think it cost me about... $400 or something like that, plus a tip at the end. Um, but that got me in before the crowds. So I, we started before they opened, and it was just me and the guide having a conversation. It was absolutely phenomenal. Um, now, you could do this if you were there for a family of four. It, it wouldn't be any, probably any more expensive than what I paid. If you were there with a group of eight or 10, uh, it would be even cheaper per person because to do this as a small group price, they do a, there's a set amount plus so much per person that's in the group. And so that, that's how that's done. I used um, the Roman guy uh, as my tour guide and they hooked me up with a lady who was just absolutely phenomenal. Um, so we started uh, by sitting down and talking about the Sistine Chapel. We sat down in the lobby um, before we went out into the museums and she, she had this notebook of pictures and things and talked me through the Sistine Chapel because she wasn't going to be able to go into the chapel with me. Tour guides are not allowed to go in. And so uh, we, we did that and then we started. And this picture that I put up here at the beginning of the video is walking from that lobby out into the courtyard uh, where we were on our way to the museums. And you can see just across the distance there is Michelangelo's dome on St. Peter's Basilica. Now, walking toward going into the museums, we walked past uh, this famous pine cone statue. And a lot of people look at that and they say, pine cone, what in the world? And that was my first impression. Why in the world do we have a pine cone out here? And why is this such a big deal? Well, there are two or three things. So first of all, in Roman mythology, the pine cone was associated with Venus, the goddess of love. The pine cone is also engraved into the shaft that the Pope carries to religious uh, festivities. And, um, and the pine cone is 
Uh, a pretty good example of uh, the golden spiral and the Fibonacci sequence, if you're a mathematician. Uh, the golden spiral is seen uh, pretty much throughout nature, and, and the pine cone is a good example of that. So this particular sculpture was actually a fountain at one point, uh, and, and where all of the little pine cone leaves come out, that's where the water came out of the fountain. And so it was eventually moved to uh, the Vatican, and it was moved again to this spot when this area was finished. To give you some idea of the massiveness of what you're looking at here, this pine cone statue is about 13 feet tall, and it's already about maybe 10 or 12 feet off the ground, and then you've got this humongous building behind it. it is, it's just beautiful and impressive, and then at the bottom, you'll see these two um, peacocks. And these are not the original peacocks. These are uh, replicas. The original peacocks are actually inside the Vatican Museum. And I took a picture of one of them here. You can see the intricacy of the brass work here uh, that has held up over so incredibly long. Um, they are just they're just beautiful. They're just beautiful pieces of sculpture. Once we got inside, I took a picture of one of the hallways with statuary down both sides. And there are a couple of statues here that are really important. One is of uh, Caesar Augustus and uh, one is of Julius Caesar and some others in there. I wasn't really that interested in that. The reason I took this picture um, was to demonstrate the fact that if you were to come here during opening hours, this place would be packed. Every square foot of the Vatican Museums in normal times, maybe not so much now as we're coming out of COVID, but in normal times, it is shoulder to shoulder people. And you can't really see anything that's not above your head. So to be able to see things on the wall or to be able to actually look down and see the floor is, is incredible because you don't get to do that if you go later in the day. That's one of the reasons why I highly recommend if you go to see the Vatican Museums, book a tour that goes in at 7.30 or 8 o'clock in the morning before they open the doors to the general public. In addition to this particular um, area, I also took a picture of this floor and you can see that uh, the floor, you can tell it's a mosaic. Uh, it has been moved. It was originally a floor somewhere else, and it was uh, painstakingly moved and recreated in this, uh, what they call the rotunda or something like that effect. Anyway, this room, again, was designed by Michelangelo, and the dome at the top is patterned after the Pantheon. And so that's sort of the feel that you get here. But you can, I'll zoom into this picture quite a bit. You can see the intricate detail of putting this floor together out of um, tile. And again, if you were in here during normal hours, much of this floor would be covered. You wouldn't be able to see any of it. Um, the, the basin that's here in this room is, I think, about 20 feet wide, maybe wider than that. I don't, I don't remember the exact dimensions. Um, some say that it was the, the tub that Nero used to bathe in. I don't know if that's true or not. Um, but this was sort of a, a, a particular kind of thing that was not unusual during this time. But the size of this is unusual. And it is made out of a particular uh, type of stone that I can never pronounce. So I'll put it here on the screen. You can figure it out for yourself. It's not granite, but it's something like granite. But it is known for this beautiful purple luster that it has. You'll see it a lot on the floors um, in St. Peter's Basilica. You will see it a lot throughout there as well. And to have this one piece carved out of one big block is just amazing. It is amazing. We also went through um, what they call the, um, the map room. 
and the map room, uh, you'll see it's so solid gold at the top. Now that's gold leaf, obviously, um, but it has been painted with a gold leaf. And keep in mind that these ceilings are just dome ceilings. They're flat. So everything that you see up there that looks like a frame or looks like it's sculpted into the wall, that is all done with a paintbrush. Um, and it is just amazing to walk through. But the map room along the sides are pieces of Italy. And so it is uh, as, as it was at the time that the map room was created, of course. But it's, it's interesting because it is shown from the uh, viewpoint of the Pope standing in Vatican City. So when he looks down at Sicily, at the bottom of Italy, that map is upside down because that's the way that it would be viewed from there. Uh, so some of the maps are kind of twisted and turned and whatever as you go along. But what is amazing is how accurate these maps are. Um, that they really do have a pretty good idea of the cartography of the time. Um, and this hallway is just, it's just huge. It lasts forever of map after map after map. There is another hallway that is filled with tapestries. They're filled with tapestries. <laughs> um, and uh, that room, that hallway is very dark because they don't want the light to come in too much on that to, to fade them out. Uh, but the, and, and I, I couldn't get a very good picture in there at all uh, from, from where I was. So I, you won't see much from there. But um, again, it, the hallway is about as long as the map room, uh, pretty much the same, same square footage. And all of the tapestries display different biblical stories. And there's one with Jesus and the tapestry is made such that no matter where you stand, Jesus is looking at you. The eyes follow you everywhere you go, just like with the Mona Lisa, um, which is pretty, pretty good tapestry work, uh, if you ask me. And then one of the things too that, I, I, well, a couple of things that, that really amaze me. I, I'll, start with, I'll start with this one first. And that's the Borgia Apartments. Now, the Borgia Apartments, you've probably heard of a Netflix miniseries called The Borgias. Um, and it is about this Pope, um, Alexander VI, maybe. I forget what his name is. Um, he came to power in 1492. That date may ring a bell because there was a Pope that sent Christopher Columbus off to find a path to China, stumbled into the United States. That's the Pope. He is, according to my tour guide, the most hated Pope in history. Um, because he wasn't much of a Pope. Um, he had six kids, I think, multiple affairs with women made no bones about the fact that he had these kids. In fact, their names are carved into certain areas of the apartments. Um, but I've got a couple of just snippets of a couple of rooms from the Borgia apartments. For years, for almost 200 years, these apartments were sealed off. No popes would live in them. There's no pope lived in it since the Borgia years. Um, but they were sealed off and nobody went in. They weren't allowed to even walk through the room. So now they are empty rooms. So you can see the floor, you can see the beauty of the walls and the ceiling. And trust me, this man spared no expense in decorating <laughs> his apartment rooms. Um, so you can see again, these, these beautiful murals at the top, the frescoes there that are painted into the plaster. Um, things along the wall, one room has um, tapestries all around the room out of a particular pattern. Um, and then one room has, I think, about a six-foot fireplace in it um, with his son's name carved across the mantelpiece, of course. Um, and so the rooms are just beautiful, but they have not been open to the public 
for very many years. So um, it, was, it was really interesting to be able to go through them and, and think about sort of the dark side of the church um, and how, how things have shifted over the years um, and the opulence that this man surrounded himself with. Um, and that leads me to one of the primary reasons for going, and that is the Raphael rooms. Now, there are, I think, five Raphael rooms. Each one has a distinct theme. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about two or three pictures here as we go along. Um, the thing to keep in mind about the Raphael rooms is that Raphael and Michelangelo were painting at the same time. Now, Raphael was in his early 20s, as was Michelangelo. Um, Raphael was already an accomplished painter with students. So he had all of these people there to help him with the, the designs in these rooms. Michelangelo was not a painter. He was a sculptor. And uh, it's one of the reasons why he originally said no to painting the Sistine Chapel, because he thought that the Pope was trying to set him up for failure and embarrass him. But he did eventually agree to do it. Now, the two men were painting at the same time. So Raphael's painting these five rooms, Michelangelo's painting the Sistine Chapel. It took several years to complete both of them. I think it took six years for Michelangelo to complete the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, excuse me, and another four years to complete the wall behind the altar, so a total of 10 years altogether. Raphael actually died, I think, while he was in the middle of painting his rooms and his students carried on and finished some of the work. But they had a, a, they had a deep distrust of each other an artistic distrust of each other, the, uh, the trying to keep one another from stealing each other's ideas. So at the end of the day when they were finished painting, they would lock their rooms up so that the other person couldn't get in. But what Michelangelo didn't know was that Raphael was friends with the guy who had the keys to the Sistine Chapel. And so Raphael was able to go into the Sistine Chapel after Michelangelo had left, saw what he was doing and was just absolutely amazed because nobody had ever painted like this before. No one. Um, which is one of the reasons why it's so sad that you can't take pictures in the Sistine Chapel. So uh, I, will, I will probably later do another video kind of describing a little bit about what's there with some links to different websites where you can go and read up about it because it is quite fascinating. But in the Raphael rooms, so Raphael is painting four walls with big murals, and then he's also painting the ceiling. And remember, the ceilings are all just dome ceilings. So everything that you see that looks like it is uh, a brocade or a sculpture or some kind of carving, it's all done with paint. Um, and the other thing to remember is they're painting frescoes. And so with a fresco, um, you would typically... Uh, you have to paint while the, while the plaster is still wet and the paint gets absorbed into the plaster. That's why they last for forever, kind of like tattoos uh, getting into your skin. And so um, you, can only, you can only put up so much plaster at a time and what you had there, you had to paint that day. And then the next day when you come in, you put up a new piece of plaster and you'd paint that section. So typically what happened was the artist would have a sketch, a, a life-size sketch of what he wanted to do, and they would punch holes along the main lines of the sketch. And then they would put that up on the, on the plaster and rub a wet uh, charcoal sponge over it, and it would put little black dots on the wall, and, and so it would, it, it would help them to know where to paint and to keep everything the right size and shape and everything. Um, and that's how Raphael did the Raphael rooms. Michelangelo, on the other hand, didn't do any of that. When you look at the Sistine Chapel, every single bit of that has been painted freehand with no life-size sketch to go by. So there's some interesting stories there about Michelangelo's painting, but we're concentrating on Raphael. So 
uh, one of the rooms, I, I just took, I took a few pictures of some of the, uh, some of the uh, murals that he did, and, and I've put a couple in here that really interest me. And one is probably the most iconic uh, wall painting is the one from the room on Truth. And it is the two distinct schools of philosophy. And so in the middle, you have these two gentlemen, Plato on the left, the older gentleman, and Aristotle, I think it is, on the right. And Plato has his hand pointing up to the sky because he believes that all truth comes from God down to the earth. And Aristotle, is his hand is pointing down to the earth because he's dealing with the truths of creation and the physical world and those kinds of things. So all of the people that are represented there are all supposed to be philosophers of that day. I have no idea who they are. I will say that the, the, the person who re is representing Plato is a, is a portrait of Leonardo da Vinci. Look closely. Uh, Raphael knew Leonardo da Vinci. They were alive at the same time. And so he would have met him and been able to draw a pretty good representation of what he looked like. And then right down at the bottom, you see this gentleman who looks like he's just eaten a whole box of lemons and, and you know, lost his girlfriend at the prom. Um, that's Heraclitus. And Heraclitus was uh, quite moody, grumpy, um, kind of ugly to people at times. And so Raphael used the face of Michelangelo for Heraclitus because that is how Michelangelo was. He was a very moody, prone to anger, um, forlorn, sullen individual for all of his great talent. But then if you look all the way over to the right, you will see a gentleman in a black hat and he is looking at you from the canvas. That is Raphael. He painted a picture of himself. And this is how he signed the painting. <clears throat> because when you're doing these wonderful religious murals, it was not acceptable to sign your name. That wasn't humility. Humility was to leave it unsigned. And so the artists would typically put themselves somewhere in the picture. And for Raphael, he put himself there. I have no idea who he's supposed to be representing. Um, so that's probably the picture that everybody's most familiar with from the Raphael rooms. The one that really caught my eye is this one here, and it is a smaller mural above a window. It's on a shorter wall, and it is of the, uh, the night that Peter was released from prison. And... Um, Over to one side, you see, I mean, it's dark, it's nighttime. On the one side, you see the angel, and the angel is light. And, and so that side of the image is very um, bright from the light of the angel. And you can see the light uh, mirroring off of the armor of the soldiers, which was sort of a new thing at that time to be able to add that kind of detail to a painting. On the other side of the painting, it's much darker because the only light on that side of the painting is the moon, and it's not even a full moon. But you can also see there where the light of the moon is reflected off of the armor of the soldier. So that just those little kinds of details really caught my attention looking at the Raphael rooms. Now, there are a lot of other things that I could talk about. I'm not going to bore you with those in this video. I just wanted to sort of highlight a few things. This is, this is a video not only about the pictures that I took, but also a little bit of a history lesson, I suppose. Um, and so again, if you came here from Instagram, you've landed on my blog page and you've got all the other stuff already here. If you're a subscriber to me from YouTube and came directly to YouTube, my blog post link will be in the description and my Flickr album link will be on the blog post. And every week, that's sort of how it goes. The video, the blog post, the blog post has a Flickr album, if there's one available, um, link there. If you're still with me and you've lasted all this time, which very few people do, but if you have, 
I really do appreciate you hanging around. I hope that you have enjoyed this little trip through the Vatican Museums. Next week, we're going to look at St. Peter's Basilica. <clears throat> and if you would, if you've not already done so, please hit the subscribe button. Hit the little like button. Let people know that you enjoyed this video. Uh, turn on the notification bell so that the next time the video comes out, you'll, you'll know about it and come back and see what's going on then. And I really do appreciate it. Until next time, I hope you enjoy your coffee.